Just there we uh, go. All right. Seen the what? Air. It's a documentary yeah. about. Um, I've heard it's awesome about it um, the guy behind uh, um, Jordan. Jordan's. Jordan's. Um, it's pretty great. Yeah, I mean, he was he was hustler. Have you heard of StockX? Yeah, that's like I think based in Detroit. That's a huge company. Yeah. I just Isn't sold some shoes on StockX the other day because I had them laying around, laying around. I was like, get rid of these. So it's just a platform for shoe flipping. Yeah, and their their whole sales point is they they review the shoes before they they send it out, so they make sure they're not fake. Or oh, so it's like, like an audit. Issue. Yeah, oh, that's cool. But they take a huge cut of the the sell or the purchase. It's, so they review they review like the individual shoe yeah, itself. Yeah, so in, in, if you're selling a shoe, you know they create a market instead of selling sending it directly to the customer, you send it to them and they review it and they put a little stamp on it and then they send it out to the the buyer. That's cool. I had a chance to go to the I Promise School, the bronze school in Akron. Mm. And despite what you think, so what he did was, I think all of his playoff shoes, they sold one of them for charity and charity auctions. And then the whole building is lined with the shoes. It's actually really cool. He's, they like raised a boatload of money from people buying one of the shoes, Amazing. not the other one. <laughs> Didn't put his whole soul into it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. So That's Michael cool. Jordan's house is for sale in Highland Park. You can't sell the thing. And if you buy the house, I think it's for like 13 million bucks, he'll give you a pair of Jordans, one pair of every single Jordan that ever he ever created in your size. So if that won't convince you to buy his outdated 90s home for 14 million bucks. <laughs> Isn't it been for sale for a long time? Long time, can't sell it. It's in a horrible location. Yeah. It's got so, like 30 bathrooms, they all need to be renovated. But the gate has 22 on it, right? 23. 23, mm -hmm. <laughs> 22, <laughs> 22, 22 short, 21, short, whatever it takes. Big time. Yeah. <laughs> so I told him this story and I'll tell you, sorry for the repeat story, my buddy's dad, loves golfing. His one vice is goes plays golf trips by himself for whatever reason. So he went and teed off at this nice course in Vegas and uh, hits his first shot. Some guy behind him was like, Hey, do you want to pair up? Turns around. It's Jordan. So he's like, of course would love to. So Jordan gets the first tee box and he's like, so um, you want to gamble a little bit? And he goes, no way. I've heard all the stories. No chance. He goes, come on, man, just 10 a hole, have it fun. Easy. He's like, fine, we'll play. So he ends up, my buddy's dad beats him by eight strokes. Wow. They go have lunch. Jordan's like, let me go run out to the car. Walks back in with a duffel bag of 80 grand. And he hands it to him, puts it down. He goes, dude, I thought we were playing for 10 bucks a hole, not 10 grand a hole. <laughs> so he's like, no, no, it's all yours. Keep it. Second Michael Jordan says, hey, you want to play some golf? I'll bet some money on it. I mean, like you're getting hustled. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be your caddy. Yeah. We'll call it. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's do, we should start over from the beginning now. Let's, let's do it from the top, right? Tom? Is there a top? This will be the top. We'll do it when we get it over with. We'll go like this. Ready? Uh, hello and welcome <laughs> to another episode of the Aaron Crane Show and the Who Says That podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sitting at the table with two unbelievably successful and amazing people. To my left is Wade Burgess, who everybody knows. Um, Wade, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Right, There's at least three people that know me. That's true. I was about true. to say everybody definitely And knows. you know, my mom listens. That was the joke that, that nobody listens except my mom. So and it's great. Hey, mom. like on every post and everything. She'll like That's and cool. comment. Yeah, I like that. And we're also joined by Matt Baxter, who I had the pleasure of, of meeting today. And Matt has a fantastic story. He's incredibly entrepreneurial and has some really great knowledge to drop to our listeners. He also has a podcast that we're going to promote as well. So we're going to do this cross collaboration between the Aaron Crane Show and the Matt Baxter Show. Really creative names for both of us. You know, but there's a thing to that. High-end marketing You guys are marketers for 100%. sure. Yeah. You know, Joe Rogan got away with the Joe Rogan Show, the oh. Howard Stern Show. Tim so. Ferriss Show. There you go. All so the big ones are Rogan's just the names. is an experience though. Yeah, yeah. Just show. The Matt Baxter Experience. How, How far original. away do you think we are from getting tattoos of people or people getting tattoos of our show name like Rogan? Have you seen those? You're a long ways away. Mm. I thought I was getting close. <laughs> if you do it out, there's a tattoo parlor around the corner from here. So, where are we doing it? Calf? Back of the calf? Well, sure. Okay. I think a little more risque, but. <laughs> oh, I'm in for that. Anyway, never mind that. So, Matt, just real quickly, can you just, set, just tell us real quick in, in from 30,000 feet about you, who you are and your career and your career path and how you had the great fortune of ending up here at this table with me. Um, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, Matt Baxter, and I'm originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I started a little landscaping and lawn care company when I was in middle school, high school, college. Had a chance to sell that, and I started what my business is today called uh, Wedge. It's a video interviewing software platform, so I'm in HR tech. So typical career transition is you go from mowing lawns to software, and specifically HR software. Um, as a fun side hustle, I started this podcast called The Matt Baxter Show. It's about purpose, passion, and calling. It's been kind of one of the most life-changing things in my life. I've gotten to meet some amazing people. And how I originally, or actually how I'm sitting at this table is because I sent a random LinkedIn message to Wade. I said, hey, can I grab coffee? He said, yeah. So I drove to Chicago. We hung out and 
got to know each other and become friends since. So I think that's kind of why I'm here. Is great, great. My version of that story too. Uh, I, <laughs> I was a creepy message. It's like, Hey, do you want to get together? Well, actually <laughs> so I, I was at LinkedIn and I was um, leading the sales uh, team for LinkedIn talent solutions at the time. It was like two thirds of the revenue of the, of the business. It was like, it was the, the primary business we had. And so HR tech introductions were very common. People who had good ideas would come to us uh, from partnership. And that's, yeah. I, and I responded to my messages a lot back then. Um, <laughs> and, and Matt's, so Matt's message was like, a guy who was just you know, like this, this, uh, you could tell like young, excited entrepreneur who wanted to have coffee seemed reasonable. And so I was <laughs> nothing, at the point of like, like not back not, alley or anything. Like that. <laughs> I, and I didn't want to like go, I was, you know, commuting even, even then I was sort of like not in the office every day. I'd travel a lot and commute. So I'm like, one coffee shop near my house would be fine. I didn't realize it was like five hours from where he lived. <laughs> it was a hike. But, but then when we met and I realized he'd driven over from Michigan to have coffee, I'm like, okay, this guy's serious. Like he's serious about his business, making a commitment to it. And I don't know, we just kind of connected in, in more about mindset even than about business at that point. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think we had a unique one, both kind of blue collar background. You come from farm, I landscaping, yep. lawn care, and then obviously you jump into tech. So there's not that many people who've made that transition too. But I also think there's a broader picture behind just a job. I think there's mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial conversation, the life conversation, and there's probably more to it than just making money that I think we've related on. Well, yeah. here, let me just interrupt. You, you glossed over something that I think would be interesting because you said you get a lot of LinkedIn messages about people who do similar stuff. Mm -hmm. But you, what specifically was it about Matt and his message that you responded to and were willing to have coffee with him. It was direct and succinct. It wasn't some big, long, flowery <laughs> intro to something and evasive. It was very direct about, uh, I'm in this industry. I want to, I should actually look it up. Um, are you open to a cup of coffee? And, and I, I appreciate that. I can appreciate a very direct uh, conversation with someone. He didn't pretend that we knew somebody in common. He didn't have some fluffy, you know, check out this video link. It was just, um, clear. Um, I think most people are pretty receptive to a direct message. I, I have, since you said yes to that, I've kind of always had the philosophy that I should say yes to similar people to mm -hmm. reaching out to me, but it's amazing how such crap is out there. Somebody mm -hmm. is trying to pretend that they're not selling something, but they're selling something. I've had a lot of, Hey, we know this similar person. And then I reach out to that person. They're like, I have no idea who that is. So, I mean, you run into a lot of that and that's, I mean, yeah. I, I, I've tried to always be like, I'd love to meet. I have no idea what the outcome is going to be. I think it's going to be worth our time. Again, I don't know what for, but it's going to be at least, if nothing else, a good conversation, not a waste of 30 minutes and a coffee. Yeah. I mean, I could go through, if I open link, my LinkedIn app right now, there's probably 40 or 50 invites from the last couple of days. And I guarantee you several of them start with LinkedIn suggested we connected. <laughs> Who am I to argue? I would love to, I would love to add you to my professional network. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Thanks. And Hey, we, uh, we have some similar interests, all this super generic stuff. That's not relevant. So uh, yeah, I mean, think direct messaging also, I mean, the easiest person in the world to sell somebody to sell something to is a salesperson. That's what we were saying last night. <laughs> Sales we got, we got upsold the most on sold. every single thing on the menu. Every For single sure. thing they offered, we got upsold on. Yeah. Cause we're salespeople <laughs> because it, yeah. And, and so there's a lot of that. That's interesting. I think that's really good advice for people. Cause I know when I'm, you know, in my business trying to reach out to people, it's this balance of what do I say and not come across too pushy or come across disingenuous, which I, I think often is, is a problem or how do we get people just to, to click, right. And, and react and engage. Yeah. I mean, I think you need to be, um, you need to be like polite, I guess, but people who are evasive have something to hide yep. or they're ashamed of something in my mind. And so if someone kind of is indirect about what they're trying to accomplish, I wonder why. Like, why is this person not being direct? So, and so to me, it's, it's pretty easy. It's also easy to say no. Yeah. And so if someone's clearly, you know, direct and they're secure with themselves, they say, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, I don't, I don't think it's a good use of our time. Um, two people who have a decent self-image can have that conversation much better than dancing around things and meeting three times to decide whether they should actually do business or not. I have found that CEOs and founders almost always say yes to a meeting and vice presidents always say no. <laughs> it's this weird like complex of like, yeah. I feel like people truly at the top are the ones who are like, no, I get it. I get the journey. I'm willing to chat. I'd like to know your intentions, but willing to at least say yes, even if it's a, hey, can't meet, but I'll take a 10 minute phone call. Whereas you have the VPs, you have all these that are like, no, no, we're too important for you. And it's probably because they've never been there. I've, I've found that to be time and time again, true. Yeah, there was a, there's a story about, I think it was Eisenhower. 
uh, there's a, a general, I know that they were in, it was, I think, trench warfare, but they were somewhere, and a private had, uh, or no, the, the general uh, lit a match to light his uh, cigarette or cigar, whatever he was smoking. And uh, private's like, put out that damn match. And then he realized who it was. And he's back so I'm really sorry, sir. He says, be glad I'm a general, not a sergeant. So that middle it's management so is usually the most insecure. It's so true. Yeah. I've also, the other thing too I've done, so, I mean, I get a lot of people who think I'm rich and uh, financial advisors will reach out because you have CEOs on, on your title. And every single time I'm like, hey, I already work with somebody. I'm happy to meet. If I can help you, great. If we can, but probably just not going to become a client. And you quickly vet out people who are like, no, I'd still love to meet. And let's chat and get mm -hmm. to know each other who have intentions beyond. All I want to do is sell you one thing right on the spot right there. And it's like, or there, you get a lot of people who are like, ah, man, I'm not going to waste my time. If It's like, okay, fair enough. That's cool. We can talk about other things outside of financial planning. But that I've learned, yeah. you can quickly vet people out who actually want to meet you versus they just want to sell to you. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if they have their canned, no, they can't gosh. talk track. Yeah. When someone goes into presentation mode right away in a conversation, even if they're not actually presenting a deck yeah. or something, when they're in presentation mode, you're like, this they just had this canned talk track <laughs> and like, I'm, I'm disinterested. Yeah. Genuine people, I find usually, first of all, they ask questions. And you tend and to not go, the what about you questions? I hate that yeah, yeah. somebody asks a thoughtful question. The best they've got is, well, what about you? And mm -hmm. it's like, no, no, come up with something original. Yeah. Cause they're looking for the, the hook. <laughs> and then there's other people like Matt and I, where you, we can't finish a complete thought because we go off in all these different rabbit holes and never ends up anywhere tangible. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely, there's definitely that as well. We need somebody who has like, for example, legal background who could keep us on track with her, with That's, our thinking. It'd actually be great if we found that. Imagine, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Somebody that could yeah, like, do podcasts <laughs> and like, keep them organized Video, or something. legal, I mean, if that gem out there existed, we should talk to him. <clears throat> All right, <laughs> transitioning it. And I didn't even know where to transition you from that, but thank you for, for That's trying the to goal. include me. Yeah, yeah. The goal. All yeah, right. yeah, we're trying to so, derail you the whole time. So both of you went from, to, you started a different industry, lawn care, you were doing construction, then you ended up doing these completely different things in tech. What, how, how would you describe that, that transition? What changed in you or what did you say? I've had enough of this. I want something bigger and better in my life. Or was there something specific, an incident that happened that propelled you in a different direction? So mine, I think was, um, I had I got an offer to sell the business. I was living in Ann Arbor and I went to Hope College, which is two and a half hours away. And so I was going back and forth a ton. So it was honestly just a good life transition. All the family had moved over. So for me, it was good timing just to kind of part ways and sell the company and it was fun to sell the business. And so then it wasn't that I was ready to sell the company and then start this. It was like, there was a little bit of period of time, started thinking about the idea, started pursuing it and then launched it. So there wasn't any massive aha moment of get out of this, get into this, but it was more, had, a, had an opportunity to sell, good time to walk away and then launch this next business. But you had this idea, mm -hmm. right? Of HR tech. Like, where did that even come from? You were, you had your experience in lawn care. So in lawn care, um, when you hire people, resumes don't mean that much. In fact, in most jobs, resumes don't mean that much. So my whole thesis was if I can put an employee in front of a customer, think about, we mowed a lot of older women's yards, right? And you've got big burly guys who might be intimidating, might be, you know, whatever show up with chew in their mouth, have tattoos all over, whatever it is. If I can trust that person or train that person to go talk to that per, that customer, I could teach them how to mow lawn. I could teach them how to spread mulch. I could teach them all those different things. It wasn't the actual job that was important. It was more how personal was that? And so it felt like that niche expanded far beyond just lawn care, landscaping, jobs like that. It felt like there was a much bigger audience for that. And so the idea came from, can we create a platform that allows for sort of better understanding of who the person is in the early stages of hiring that allowed companies to kind of have that insight beyond just what a resume is? Because a resume is one single sheet of paper that one, most people lie on, fake, fluff, whatever it is, but let's create an opportunity for people to actually like, hey, I get to know you in a quick snippet that I can share with my team. So that was the original idea. So Six, can we pull on that thread for a minute? Sure. Because yeah. that's one of the things that really attracted me to your idea from the start was, well, let me ask you this. Do you think in the same way you describe lawn care is like you're really looking to hire the person and you can teach them the skill. Yep. You find the same thing in your company, like in tech jobs and sales jobs, marketing jobs. Yeah. So, I mean, with, so we're a company of anywhere between 15 to 20 people and especially 
entrepreneurial company where there's no such thing as a job description. Now there's jobs that need to get done, mm-hmm. but multiple people can cross over on those jobs. It's not like one person's filling one role. So, you know, I, I would say in our business, for sure, we definitely hire people versus roles. Now we're starting to get to the point where it's not less entrepreneurial, but it's more like building a structure of a company. Mm-hmm. There's it's, it's, a, we're in a weird transition of going from kind of throw darts at the wall and see what sticks to now like operationalizing what works well. And that takes, a, I think, a different hurdle. I think you have a lot more operations focus, methodical people versus eh, whatever, we'll figure it out. So yeah, so you get diffused. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I think from the start, we what, five years ago, whenever we first met, and I had a chance to, in some capacity, work with you, I- investor advisor, whatever it is yeah, that we yeah, do, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, but I've also watched as the team grows, I don't know what each person does. I don't yeah. know. But anytime I'm around people on your team, they're like, they're motivated to be good at what they do. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're like, there's this aura of good energy, good work ethic, the right attitude. I don't know anything. I don't need to know like technically what they do, yeah. but the, that culture you've created somehow, I think is about the, the seems to be from the outside looking in is about the people and yeah. about the energy and about what we're trying to accomplish. I'm sure they have their tactical skills. So you wouldn't have a business, but it's interesting how you've kind of, you know, put together a group of people who think similarly. Yeah. It's I'm probably it's just over the last 10 years reflecting of what being an entrepreneur is. I definitely uh, am not, I'm like, the worst micromanager. In fact, like I don't do any, like I probably need to be a little bit more involved in day-to-day of what people are doing. I kind of, I'm, I treat people as if they were me, which is not always good because it's like, I don't need a whole lot of structure. I don't need to know what I'm today, what I'm waking up doing, I'll figure it out. And I think that's great when you're first getting going, but once you start to build, you know, the organization and the structure of the team, that's a transition. Yeah. And that's why I've tried to, and made mistakes, plenty of mistakes on this, but I've tried to get ahead of that when it comes to like, Theo, for example, I wanted yeah. to hire Theo to help build some of that structure because I know I will never be the structure guy. Yeah. So, and that's that's certainly a skill set I'd much rather hire out, partner out than try to create myself because I. Well, I think I mean most founders, any entrepreneur, I think realizes pretty quickly what their strengths are and what they are not. Yeah, and they do. You know, I had a chance to see this at some of the some of the biggest companies out there where very early on founder realized they're not an operator. Yeah, and they bring in an operator and a, and a great one, or they realize they're not, you know they're maybe just a product focused person only. Um, and you see that I had a chance to see that with uh, at LinkedIn, you know, Reed Hoffman very quickly brought in CEO yep. and then brought in a different CEO and, and, you know, clearly it worked really well. You see uh, what he launched on with Twitter, you know, he, he, you know, finally brought in a CEO and he yep. realized his strength is maybe more around uh, product. I don't know. Um, but, but I think founders typically find that like, what's my sweet spot, hire everything else. Do you prefer, so I know you have lived in both. You've mm-hmm been a part of large organizations and you've also been entrepreneur yourself. What do you, when you wake up and which do you default towards? You know, I used to think like once the company gets to a certain size, they behave a certain way and therefore I don't want to be in this big, huge thing. And I still have a little bit of that. I'm, I'm not a real process guy. <laughs> um, but I found that's not necessarily true. So for example, when we, uh, Microsoft bought LinkedIn and my thought when we first had those conversations was like, wow, there's this big, huge monster organization with hundreds of thousands of employees. And I don't want to be a part of that. But I also looked at the way that Satya uh, leads that organization and how empowered people are, even in this mammoth company to be strong in what they do. So I don't necessarily think size of company is everything because yeah. you know, there are companies that have five people and they have, you know, the owner's a micromanager. And so even though they're a small company, you're like, you have these ramps and rails that you just can't move. Yep. So I think it's more about the culture of empowerment. Yeah. I like environments where people are empowered to be the best version of themselves and they're held accountable. Because for someone like me who has, you know, definitely professional ADD, <laughs> it's accountability is no huge. No personal either? <laughs> uh, probably just all over the board, yeah. Uh, but you know, like it, it's, Accountability, somebody who wants to win, wants to be held accountable. Like yep. nobody has a coach that they're like, this coach was so great because we never really had to do anything. Yeah. Like no one ever says that. So I look for like empowerment to be creative and to get things done like in a way that maybe that's best suited for you, but also the accountability to get there. So I don't know, there's this balance between the structure and freedom that's really important. I, I the. The accountability piece, I think, is one I hold myself to a pretty high standard. I don't do a great job necessarily as a leader holding people to strict accountability that's beyond just numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, you have, hey, here's your quota, you got to go hit. But I think there's a that's something I've learned 
I think one of the hardest parts about leadership is truly how hard it is to hold people accountable. Now you mm -hmm. can build great systems in place, but at the end of the day, you're sitting across from somebody and it's your responsibility to do that. Yep. That's something I've definitely, uh, I have a lot of improvement. Well, I mean, maybe, because if you look at what really matters, um, I think most things actually don't have to be measured. And sure. this is counterintuitive to a lot of people, but it's like when you're shipping a product, the MVP, like the minimum viable product, I lean on minimum. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the one thing that really matters? And from a leadership standpoint, most of the teams that I've um, led that are at any size are either sales or marketing or some go-to-market function. Using sales as an example, what really matters? Clearly integrity and honesty and that. But what really matters, there's a number. And I've always said, you know, if you hit your, if you hit your number, you're standing on your head in the middle of Mexico City, I don't care. Yeah, That is the one thing that ultimately matters. The tactics and the way they do it, um, you know, I, I was, I'm thinking right now, uh, there's a leader, a guy named Jim Deddy. He's one of the best uh, recruiters of great sales talent that I know, enterprise sales talent. And the people that have worked with him and for him are all over the board as far as personalities and their styles and methodology. You put them in one room, it's just chaos and yeah, fun. That's awesome. But he's, you know, somebody who's figured out how to identify the essence of what makes a great enterprise salesperson. Yep and then lets them be themselves. Mm. Now, somebody who likes a lot of structure and discipline and spreadsheets, not gonna work well. they're, they're, not, they're, they're <laughs> yeah. probably not gonna be on the same page. But, but the point is, that matters. I also know people who are like really structured in the way they run organizations. Right now, the Chief Revenue Officer of Gong, and Ryan Longfield. Like, from the ground up, he's really a structured, disciplined, organized person, uses data to make intelligent decisions, and he also creates a high-performing organization. So, very different people. Yep but they can get the best out of them. And I can look through some people who are like great salespeople, like a Dana King, who's like one of the best salespeople ever, also a great leader. And there's others who were never really that great at the task, but they're good leaders. How do you as an organization, if you're, if you're kind of designing that, not create a total conflict with other leaders in the organization? So if you think like, okay, that's revenue, go to market, mm -hmm. marketing side, how do you then have a totally not conflicting product side, for example? This is so I find myself uh, surprisingly in sort of a consulting business right now. And a lot of it is this conflict yeah. resolution with exec teams, <laughs> either founders. Yep. When you have more than one founder, you have more than one founder. And so <laughs> anything in nature with multiple heads has some issues. And uh, so I, I find a lot of this. Number one is shared vision. Yep. Like you have to come to that irrefutable common ground. What do we ultimately want to achieve? If you can't agree on what success looks like, what the vision is when this, when we accomplish it, then somebody needs to go. Yeah. So number one, I think it's lying around the vision and then how we're going to get there. The basics of that has to be, I think, sorted. Is this a go to market issue? Is this going to be M and A? Is this going to be, or, you know, organic sales? Are we going to expand our product line? Or are we going to expand geographically? Or, yep. Those tactics I think are really important. For example, if you believe you need to increase your feature set and that's how you're going to expand, you're going to have a broader, a, a deeper portfolio of products or features. Yep. That's different than we have a good enough MVP and we're just going to market just in going a big way. Yeah, yeah. Then that's basically a go to market approach versus a product approach. Are you going to have, you know, a sales team or are you going to have product led growth? Like those fundamentals, I think you have to agree. What's the vision? What are the main tactics? And and then who is best suited to accomplish it? Yeah. I think it only works when people aren't self centered. Like I may not be necessary for where the company needs next. I might not be the right person to take us there. Yep. That's really hard to do. <laughs> but if you can get people who are that self-aware, that's how you can really win. Usually you're just dealing with insecurity. Yeah. Conflict between people is usually fear. Some kind of fear or insecurity. Yep. And then that's when you end up with these, you know. That and I feel like uh, mismanaged or un unspoken expectations, I think are mm -hmm. one of the greatest forms of conflict. Of I have an yeah. expectation on you or vice versa and I haven't vocalized that. So you're constantly gonna be set up to be disappointed with somebody, yeah. no matter what. And I, I think ultimately that falls on me having an expectation on you that I didn't vocalize. I think that's true, I think it falls on you. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 completely I, my fault. I yeah. think 100% of the time we have a conflict, it's on you. I Let's think every it. single time we yeah. get together and we fight about something, it's usually <laughs> or always my fault. Yeah, no, so but, you know, this, this is true in personal relationships too. Yeah. If I have an expectation of something and my wife does something differently than the way I expected it, 
and I'm upset about it, that's on me. Yeah. I just assumed. Totally. And vice versa. And it turns out my wife and I are different. Yeah. Shockingly. Um, but I know for a fact your wife's never wrong. And it's actually, there's a no. lot of truth to that. She's <laughs> right more often than I am for sure. But, but you know, we will have an expectation. It's not even the thing that gets done. It's the way in which the other person does it. Yeah. And like, I'm weird and all over the place. And so <laughs> that you understand. Um, but occasionally. Don't rope me into that. Uh, <laughs> that's part of that. So uh, my Y chromosome does have some influence in the way in which I make decisions. But I think once you learn to understand the other person, then you, over time, we've been married a bit. And over time, you start to say, 26 years. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. And uh, I mean, best decision I've ever made. Best natural decision I've ever made. I think that's one of the most important things in life is choosing who you spend your time with. Clearly, choosing a a mate is is very important. Choosing a spouse, if people do that. But also in business and everything else, who you spend your time with. Like, I couldn't have made a better choice. Yeah. She, Andrea has to put up with a lot. <laughs> I mean, like, imagine. Um, and I do just a little bit. But between the two of us, it's 100%. Yeah. It's just about 90, 10, her. But I think that, that that choice, that empowers me a lot. Because without her, um, not, not just love, but like grace, I couldn't be me. And hopefully vice versa. Well, if you move that into business... I think it's also true that like, if you really respect somebody and you give them the grace to be themselves, you have so much more success Yeah. than if you want people to do things the way you do it. Well, this is how you should do this because this is how I do it. Yeah. You should think like I do. That's not only ineffective, but it frustrates both parties. I, um, I can't believe I'm about to quote this, but I did listen to a Brene Brown, Tim, Tim Ferriss conversation. Mm-hmm. And one of the things she was talking about is in, in her marriage, it's never 50, 50. It's always one day somebody's got 80, the other person's got 20, the other vice versa in communicating mm-hmm. that. And I've, I, I'm not married, so I'm not going to act like I can understand that. Yeah. But I think in business for sure, that's true with certainly different leaders on your team and communicating that like, hey, this is a tough season. We're going through mm-hmm. a lot. Like, so we've raised a lot of capital, which I'm sure we'll talk about. And seasons of us going through raises, like I ha- don't have the bandwidth to give to the business what it needs. Yeah. And so trying to find a way to keep everything afloat, right? And everything going well, mm-hmm. and giving people where they need attention. I think that's a definitely something that like learning that balances. Yeah, I think it's really You important. guys touched on two, two really interesting topics. One, um, having a partner, like an investor and, and raising money and, and how that relationship between investor and business owner and founder is a lot, I would assume, I would know, mm-hmm. but it's a lot like a marriage. You know, but how do you choose then your partner, your investor, and make sure that that relationship is, is strong and that the, you know, the investor understands what is needed of the founder and the founder understands what's needed of the, of the investor? So I, I can go a little bit into the raising money bit if we want to go down that path for a while because I think I have a little bit of a non-traditional We've raised like six million, seven million, so not necessarily huge in the grand scheme of Silicon Valley, New York, but enough to be there. So the very first fifty grand check I got, I was at Hope, and I got introduced to a wealthy alumni, Bill Van Fossen, and uh, he, I get scheduled for a call, and he picks up the phone. He's like, "You got three minutes." Mm-hmm. First thing he said, and he was like, "Give me a minute long in your background." I'm at Hope, just graduated, or I'm still at Hope, just sold my lawn care. I've got another year and a half till I graduate. He's like, all right, cool. Tell me about your idea. You got two minutes. So I rolled through it. And he's like, all right, thanks. That's all I need. So then hung up the phone. It was kind of like, what the hell just happened? Mm-hmm. Like, I have no idea what, what just went on. So two or three days later, I get a couple of emails from him about like hiring and how challenging it is, whatever. And he's like, do you have time to chat? So a couple of days later, we hop on the phone and he's like, so I like this business idea. How do you plan on funding it? It's like, well, I made a little bit of money on my lawn care. He's like, that's not gonna be enough. He's like, let me, let me invest. He's like, I'll write you a 50 K check. That'll be the start. And he's like, I'll introduce you to some friends. So literally like within three days, check him in. That's how we raised our first good. And that's all the diligence he did was just, that was it. He didn't look at the numbers or or nothing. I didn't have a single investor look at the numbers for the first year and a half. Not that we didn't have them, but just the type of people who were interested in that didn't look at that. And I'm, I'd like to hear your side of the story and some of those things too, but we then, so we now over the last year have brought in some institutional capital, a couple funds, and then also family office. But the first probably 4 million was through 50 to 200 K checks, all individuals and the whole premise. And even today it's, I believe in you, I believe in the, you know, your ability to figure this business out, which is the greatest thing in the world and the worst thing in the world, because it's the coolest feeling when that happens, but it's also when things don't go well, it's also that's on you. And that's something that I've, 
I think I've struggled with in certain seasons is I it's it's like the best feeling in the world to have people believe in you, but also it's like your responsibility when things go wrong, which I, I like that responsibility, but the, I think the fear of disappointment is where some of the imposter syndrome stuff kicks in. I think some of those different, so yeah, it's been, it's been a ride. We've, we've, I mean, I also, you have a, another perspective to that side of the story too, but. It's not that dissimilar though. I think when you're investing in the first part of a relationship, personal, professional, whatever, but use it as an investor, uh, n number one is trust. Everything is trust. So if you don't have trust, if you can't establish some degree of trust or credibility, then it doesn't really matter what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I think number two is it, in an early stage, you're investing in a person. Their initial idea, if they're going to move fast enough, their initial idea is probably garbage. Uh, event, you'll look back and you're like, I can't believe that was the original <laughs> idea. You're kind of betting on that. Yeah. Because people who are so attached to that idea and they're unwilling to change, they're not going to succeed as an entrepreneur. Yep. The market's going to change. Seasons are going to change. Something's going to happen. Um, you, you're really betting on the person. So I think a lot of it to me is, do I trust this person? Do I believe that they believe themselves? And do I think that they're agile enough to make changes? Hmm. Um, and are they resilient? Have they gone through? My grandfather always said, never trust a man without a limp. You know, like, have they gone through something yep, in life? Yep. Um, somebody who's had it pretty easy their whole life, and suddenly they're going to become wildly successful as an entrepreneur. Uh, maybe. Yeah. I've never seen it. I'm yep. sure it could probably happen. Yep. Um, but probably doesn't. So I look for that. I look for that resilience. And I look for work ethic, attitude. Somebody who can take themselves a little bit lightly because other people are going to laugh at you a lot. You might as yeah, well laugh gosh. at yourself. Yeah. If you can't laugh at yourself, you should. Yeah. And punch yourself. In the you face. know, the people who are like super rich and everything's perfect. I had this uh, South by Southwest every year in Austin. I get a lot of pitches. Yeah. And uh, I was in the lobby of this one uh, hotel and yeah, several pitches uh, in a row. One, I can't, one of the days this year and only one stood out because it was, it was two guys who were partners and they were, they were just being themselves. And you could tell this is probably pitch number 20 for the yeah, day, yeah, yeah. but they were very honest. I thought um, about what they believed was to be true. And they also knew that some of that wasn't going to be true. They didn't know. They, they're like, we have all these blind spots, but we think we have this and we think we're on track with that. That was solid. Mm. Everyone else I heard, they had their can pitch. Everything was too And perfect. everything was going to be perfect. Yeah. And the charts are all up and to the right. Just exactly what you Here's would Here's our patch. For. Get 10% of the market. We'll yeah. do it in three days. And, and then tell you about the, the, the TAM, the total addressable market. <laughs> you know, It's $700 billion addressable market. And all we need to do is get 5% of it. You know, It's the same pitch over and over. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's that. I think it's like that initial bit. And I don't, you know, to your point about <clears throat> like initial investor, it didn't take very long. Unpopular topic, but you know, looking back, my wife and I prior to getting married, I think we spent about 20 days together total. I love that. It was, we met in September of one year. We we're in two different states. She was Arizona, I was Nebraska. We met in Minnesota. We, New Year's Eve, I flew to Phoenix because I was living in Nebraska. December. So for it's our first date, year, first date, New Year's Eve, we were, so that was, and then we were engaged in March, married in April, but I had the MVP down, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but yeah. you know, the basics, number one is the vision of what we believed a marriage was, what we believed a family was, what we, what, the things we believed in the core essence of what we believed in, like in a business, you have that common vision, that yep. shared vision. And we had this shared alignment about value systems and ways in which decisions would be made. We knew that we'd have to figure it all out. Yep. And I'm not encouraging people to know somebody 20 days before they get married. But um, that being said, there are only a few basic things that matter a lot to you. I think that's also true in business. Yeah. And, you know, the decks that are like nine slides and then they have like a 64 slide appendix need an appendectomy. <laughs> There's only, <laughs> there's so just true. a little bit yep. that matters, but that part that matters matters a lot. Yeah. And I think, you know, just like personal relationships, I don't know how many investors you turn down, but as far as investing, and maybe invest in one out of 40 or 50. You know, I think um, the people we've walked away from have been one, it's kind of goes back to the CEO versus the VP. Like mm -hmm. you can tell the investors that have never done it. And I'm not saying that every investor now, a lot of my investors are folks that 
we never were entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but we want to help support it because we, yeah. that's like a cool journey for them to go along too. Those are great people. Mm -hmm. And as well as founders themselves, they totally get it. They get the struggle, they get the highs and lows, they get all that. But the it's, it's often funds. It's not always true, but it's usually, there's just some prick who mm -hmm. you know that they're going to come in and you know, they're going to run the business the way they want to. And it's not, mm -hmm. not that it's not good and not successful. And I'm sure they have great track records, but it's like, that's those are the people that you just I, I just don't want to get in bed with because you're mm. you actually are I mean it's it's a lifelong journey with them so yeah I, I, I don't know I've we've had a lot of very fascinating investors some are very hands on some are very hands off um, but I th I can honestly say every single person on our cap table is pretty much we believe in you we trust you at the end of the day this is you know your mm -hmm. your call your decision um and we'll be there to support you and it's it's such a cool group yeah that's i mean if, if people can get it, it comes back to like who do you want to spend your time with yeah and that is another way of how you're spending your time and resources with but you know i one time i came into a company a ceo of a company that's cap table is 62 long mm -hmm. 62 people who mostly just invested a little bit of money a long time ago knew yep. nothing about the industry but yet all had opinions <laughs> and that was convenient you know and i think that that's that's like probably what you don't want. Yeah. On the other hand, there's also kind of the golden rule, the one with the gold rules. So when you have like <laughs> one investor only, then you're also really beholden to that one so true. Um, person or that one entity. And I think, you know, being able to diversify that is, is really important. It's, it's as, if not more important than the employees you hire. Well, I also think um, I, I have asked this time and time again. I don't know if I've asked this for every person, but first thing is like, are you okay losing this money? Because if you're not, I don't want it. Yep. I'm, I hope I hand you a nice, a lot bigger of a check back, but if you're not okay losing this money, we have a, this is already a bad relationship to begin with. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I think founders, and this is, I, I would go back and ask this more, who do you want to, who, who do you want to disappoint? Meaning at some point you, mm -hmm. things are not going to go well, something's going to go wrong. Something's going to happen. It could be a lot, could be little, but who do you want to sit across from the table and say, Hey, I screwed up. Mm -hmm. This went wrong. This miss expectations. And you're going to, you're going to ultimately build a relationship with that person. It could be a really good one, a really bad one. And that's yeah. one I've realized, like, I have a great group of people I can bring good. And part of it's founder founders working through the courage to bring bad mm -hmm. news because yep. a lot of times, like with our board meetings, I want to, I want to share stuff that I need help with, not get you head nodding. Mm -hmm. Eight guys, eight girls in a room, head nodding doesn't help anything, but yeah. actually saying, Hey, this is stuff that we need to work through. And I, I have learned that through the journey is I could have brought bad news together sooner opposed to like more reactionary mm -hmm. just out of fear of like hey I don't want to disappoint people I want to make sure we look good not for my own self image but for the business's image and so that's something like I think when when picking an investor having somebody that you know that you can bring tough news good bad mm -hmm. ugly and they're going to be there like all right what do we what's next and yeah. I think that's a huge piece I think I mean I, I being have, have the courage to bring bad news is important also with employees or with anyone else. Like if I'm you sure come to a in marriages too and I mean, marriages, yeah, guess. for sure. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, but if, if you come to a board meeting and there's a surprise, you're not a good leader. Yeah. If you go to a performance review with someone and they're surprised by how you feel about how they're doing, you're a bad leader. Yeah. You know, those should be happening all the time. Like I'll, I'll get a message from you. You're calling to say, Hey, I have this thing we should talk about it's not a board meeting. It's not any of that. It's, it's like, there's something that needs to be addressed in the moment. You're yep. not going to wait 90 days to say, well, we have this meeting coming up yeah. in the same way. If, if like, you know, relating it to a marriage, if I'm like, you know, there's this thing that my wife did or said that I don't really I'm not comfortable with. So, um, New Year's Eve, we like to review the year. I'm going to put that on the list. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's a pretty ineffective <laughs> way of managing a relationship, but people do that professionally for some reason. Yeah. And I think bringing it forward also good news though, I guess good to bring good news forward. Of and course. sometimes people hesitate to celebrate. Yep. Um, but I, yeah, it's uh, when you see, for me, also, if you see founders or especially just hired management teams start to optimize for the investor, it's time to get out. Hmm. When they lose the customer, when they lose sight of in order to do this for the customer, that's where I want to put more money on. That's where I want to back somebody up. If it's yep. like, we need to do this because of our, in order to fulfill the vision of what we're trying to accomplish and delighting the customer. When the focus is there, I'm willing to continue investing if the unit economics work. When the focus is about ROI and about the return back to investors and the timing of it, and we need to exit now because of this, I'm out. Yeah. Because that tells you where their focus is. It's selfish. It's introverted. Customer loses. Yep. And I think having that focus on the customer is will it's, worth investing longer if that's where the focus is yeah i think that's why elon's so good he obsesses over the customer yeah 
I mean, best companies out there. You look at Amazon, you know, one of the largest companies on the planet with this maniacal focus on customers in so many different categories. Yeah. Bezos kind of laughs. He's like, yeah, we might miss quarterly reports, whatever. Onward. Let's focus on the customer. But abs- absent them, who would have thought you can get, you can go order something and get it to your house the same day? Yeah. This dates me, but I remember ordering from catalog for four to six weeks for delivery. <laughs> you know, like you're older by the time yeah, that thing shows say, up. You forgot what you just ordered. But, but even, even there's still a lot of today, a lot of places where you order it and like you maybe get it in a week. Yeah. And somehow that's disappointing. Yeah. And it's like a week. Jeez, I can wait for that. <laughs> like seriously, I can't get it same day. Yeah. When the drone's coming, you know, like, but because of that focus on the customer, you know, it's gone faster and faster. And of course they have a downside too. Every company has downsides, but that's where I think things become great is when you focus on a customer. So a little, little bit of a spin on the investor, uh, investee relationship. How, we talked about this, like the knowing when to hold them, knowing when to fold them. How to, how have you gone about both in your life and also you've invested in other companies and been mentors to a lot of leaders? Like how have you seen it sort of stepping away? Like you have this, you have this great parable of this is my baby. This is my business. This is everything to me. And you want that drive out of an entrepreneur. And I feel that, but at mm-hmm. the same time, sometimes things don't work. Markets change everything. How, how there's a lot of more than just one question there, but how have you kind of seen that done well, done poorly? As usual, I'll just answer the question I want to answer. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> no, no, uh, I mean, look, it, it, no matter how diligent someone is trying to be as a parent, if the children are malnourished, they're not a good parent, <laughs> yeah. you know, and the same is true with founders or yeah. with leaders of companies. It's it, look at how is it thriving or not? Yeah. And if the business isn't thriving, I don't care how much I love that person. It's like they're not succeeding. Yeah. I've done that. I've been in jobs I shouldn't have been in. Maybe all of them. I don't know. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> and there's also some point there's the, there's the the uh, S curve where there's this early stage and then it starts growing and then it takes off and there's a plateau. And often it's a different leader required to yeah. go to the next S curve. But mostly I look at, is the company thriving or not? That's the first thing. If they're thriving, I probably want to stay on that ride. Maybe, depends on a portfolio of other choices. Yeah, yeah, in life. Yeah. But you also just can't, um, if you diffuse your uh, energy too much, you're not good at anything. And so I think it's, it, to me, if I'm actively involved, especially in too many different businesses, there's a point where you're not good at any of them. Yeah. You know, jack of all trades, master of nuns, none. Um, I look at a couple of things. One is performance of the business. Number two, is that person thriving or not? If someone's investing in themselves or that people, that team of people, if you start to see a bunch of infighting and you start to see you know things that culturally are not good, it's really hard to turn a culture around. Yeah. Very rare. When a culture starts to get a little bit toxic, even if they're brilliant people, probably especially if they're brilliant people, I get concerned that if like, if there's one uh, sort of negative influencer, if they're not removed, then I'm, I'm out. Yep. Um, but it also when they start to lose their passion, you can see when someone gives up on themselves. You mm-hmm. can see when they're mailing it in. And they're kind of coasting when they're sort of done. I, right now, I'm talking to a lot of companies that are not anything to do with tech or my background. So I've been looking at companies that are uh, selling. So post COVID, there are a ton of family owned businesses. There are a bunch of service oriented businesses, home services, professional services. And the people who founded these are maybe in their 60s, 70s, something like that. They don't have a next generation coming on to yeah. buy the business. Yep. So there's a bunch of businesses for sale on the cheap right now. And they're cheap for a reason because they're not worth a lot with that yep. person gone. Yep. But I start to look at the one who still has a lot of passion for that business and they love it and they want it to thrive. And I see the other one who just wants to cash out. Yep. And there's so many of the latter. So I think a lot of it too is like, does the person who's primarily behind the company, is she or he like still really active and excited about it? Hmm. When they lose that passion, forget about everything's going to follow yeah. because everything rises and falls on leadership, in my opinion. And you gotta, that leader's got to have the juice. And if they're fired up, they don't even have to be as excited about the business. But if something in their life has them going, if you look at somebody, uh, I was talking to somebody recently that's doing a triathlon this week. I was about to say, that's why I'm doing the run. Yeah. And <laughs> you're doing this run you're talking about. It's, yeah, it's yeah. insane. When someone has that thing they're pushing for, like this person doing a try, has never done one. And he inspired me just telling me about it. Yeah. And I work with him in banking. He's like, he's an awesome dude. But when I see somebody has that, not every aspect of your life is going to be exciting all the time. But if you have something that you're passionate about, you're driven, I'll do that. But if I see somebody who's kind of just coasting, I mean, I've met people who are like 30 
and they're dead. They just haven't notified their body yet. You know, they're sadly, they're not buried until age 70. <laughs> they just give up and they yeah. shrink their dreams down around their current reality. And that's another, to me, that's another indicator of somebody I'm probably not going to spend much time with. Yeah. I want the person who their current reality is here and their dreams are like here. Yep. And they just, they're, they're pushing, they're striving and they're trying to, you know, get there. That's the person that'll find their way out of the mud. You, you brought up a point around, um, investing in like kind of a portfolio of investments. And one thing that I've, this is kind of going back as somebody who's pitched a lot of investors been told no thousands of times. I think early on founders who've never raised money before, they get offended by somebody saying no. And yes, it's them saying no, but you got to think about, it's not them just saying no to your idea. It's we have an allocated amount of time, resources, capital, whatever, that we're not, we might be putting it somewhere else that's more mm -hmm. important, more fitting to our thesis. And I think again, kind of off the rails a little bit, but I think that's one advice that I would give to people who are raising money is like, one, can't take it personally. Secondly, it's oftentimes not that they don't like the business. It's just that at the time they might be putting money, like so right now, a year and a half, two years ago, I could make three phone calls and raise money like that. Mm -hmm. Now it's a lot different because everybody's having issues with capital and it has nothing to do with necessarily our business, but yeah. it's more to do with the fact that, hey, you've got places that you need to put money, you need to allocate. And so mm -hmm. I think, yeah, founders need to, not take things too personal on that well, stuff. I mean, the, the getting told no is something too that's fascinating to me because it. this is why sales, a lot of times people have a tough time in sales. And if you look at a product-led growth or marketing type of business versus sales, if you're in marketing and you're doing various things to convert a customer from interest to intent to purchase, yeah. you don't see them say no. You only see the yeses. Yep. You see the ones that come through. Feels pretty good. If you're in sales, and so let's say you have like a 3% a conversion rate some marketing campaign and 3% actually come through and buy. You failed 97 times, but you never felt it. If you're in sales and you go out and you, you go out 10 times and you fail seven, you feel every one of those yeah. seven people say no to you. Yeah. And, but I think and the three are probably just reliefs. Just like, yeah. And you're like, oh, <laughs> finally. And I think we, we see this wrong. We see like probably the people we talked about that earlier. I think earlier, I think the, um, probably the most iterative, uh, function out there or role in society maybe as a stand-up comic because they immediately can tell whether what they said worked or didn't work. Yep. Did and I'm sure that they not. feel, I've never been one, but I'm sure that like you feel like, oh, like I thought that was going to be good. It, was, yep. it didn't go. And then you also feel the energy when, and so they iterate so quickly that the good ones, they've been out there time and time and time again. And I've heard some of these people out there talking about, um, like Joe Rogan has a lot of comedians on his, uh, on his podcast. And they'll talk about, they're trying new material out all the time. All the and time. these people who are great are find themselves bombing some percentage of the time yeah. to see if their material works or not. You'd think they'd know by now, yeah, but they don't. And this is where I think in business, like you've got to be willing to get out there and fail some. If you're not failing and getting told no, you're not doing anything. You're not doing anything worthwhile. Like yeah. you're not pushing it hard enough. I agree. So part of this, part of the <laughs> self-image thing too is like, Oh, it's not you just gotta, fit. you just gotta get over it. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I have cared so much about what people think for so long. Mm -hmm. And then you finally get to a point where you're like, mm. I mean, I, 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 I don't think there's an element of not caring at all. Like I, there's a yeah. certain level of like, you have a standard that I want to follow as a person, right? Yeah. That I'm going to hold you to, you're going to hold me to. So there's in some regards, like, yeah, I do care, but you got to get to a point where like, A, you can't take anything offensively. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not always about you. And yeah, I think you kind of need to get over some of that. Yeah. I, <laughs> I have a mentor that really helped me a lot with this too. Like, well, I'm right now. I'm in a business where I'm getting five or six more people involved, actively involved in, in what I'm doing, and I'm looking for five, maybe six. And so, as I'm talking to people, I'm just as interested in them not being the right person as them being one. Yep. So if they're not one of those five or six people, I don't. That doesn't. They're not one of the five or six. Someone else is going to be. And so I really don't care. Like if somebody starts to push back and we're talking about it, it doesn't feel like it's the right thing. Like I kind of forget the conversation before the door closes. Yeah. I don't mean that rudely. I just mean, clearly that's not the right fit. We're yeah. not going to work together. And you and I talked about this earlier. The last thing I want to do is try and get a group of people together and then try and motivate them. Yeah. Like that's a waste of energy. Yep. I want a group of motivated people and people who are wanting to do something. You collect that group when you finally get that group together. It's just like if you're interviewing candidates for jobs and you don't end up hiring that person as a hiring manager, you shouldn't feel like a failure. No. You like chose not to hire them or they chose not to take it. Yep. I think the same is true in sales. Same is true in raising money. Yeah. I, I've, you, you definitely don't want to be chasing money. I mean, there's mm -hmm. certain groups that you're like, I know there's a fit, things like that, but you really don't want to be chasing investors or trying to convince them if they don't believe in it. 
they might write you a check and that's the money that you don't really want to take because yep. you're now chasing approval. You're now chasing results that you really shouldn't be. You're now making decisions that you really shouldn't be opposed to. Hey, this person believes in me. I'm now motivated by that because they believed in me and wrote a check. Yeah. Well, some of that's posture too. Yeah. Like who's going to be in control? You know, let them win or you. Like they should, you know, like at some point they're going to regret not writing me a check. Yeah. Like you know this. Yep. Like you should know that. Yep. And so it's like, oh man, it sucks to be them because they weren't smart enough to invest in this business. Not my problem. Yep. You know, I'm not, I'm not there to build their intellect. Uh, they chose not to invest in me. How <laughs> foolish of them. I don't mean that arrogantly, but you do have to have a little swagger. Like yep. you have to believe that this is, this is the best. When you're doing a good deal, both parties should feel like they're getting a better deal. Yeah, of course. And if I write a check to somebody, hopefully every time I've invested in your company, I feel like I kind of got a, I got a win on this one. Yep. And hopefully you're so like, yeah. oh man, like I pulled one over on him. No, I'm like, <laughs> but you know, like both should feel like they're getting a good deal. Absolutely. Otherwise you have an imbalance in the relationship and that long term is going to be a problem. So how do you, if you're, if you're in a circumstance where you're kind of constantly needing to chase, how do you change that? How do you make that shift? Make more money. Yeah, that helps. I mean, you know, like it's the, the reality is like most people don't raise enough capital. Yeah. And so they're always raising capital. Yep. And it's the same thing with people's personal life. Like, well, you know, I have this and that being stressful. I mean, okay. If you put 12 months of your cost of living in the bank, how would your day-to-day -day decisions change? You wouldn't be worried about exactly what this costs, exactly what that costs. You already know the next 12 months I'm good. Yep. Most people in business, they maybe have an 18 to 24 months runway if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. They know their current burn rate and they're measuring it. And um, one is be profitable. That helps. Like I think right now, and especially, you know, venture capital doors kind of locked up about Everything's a year changed, ago yeah. and things changed a lot and people see that as negative. I think it's fantastic. No, it's finally, people are like not outrageous burns, not outrageous, mm -hmm. just dump money. It's, it's like, Hey, let's go build a business that actually makes money and serves customers. Oh. Yeah. I mean, this is sixth grade Crazy math, idea. right? Yeah. If you can balance a checkbook, which if you can't balance a checkbook by the time you're in sixth grade, and if your kids can't teach your kids how to balance a checkbook, it's math. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing in business. Like bring down the cost, bring up the income. You know, if your outgo exceeds your income, your up keeps your downfall. Yep. So I think like being being cash flow positive, even if it's painful, I think it's really important. And we have, Aaron and I have a mutual uh, uh, connection and we were talking about a year ago about some of the things that he was doing. He said, find a way to get cash flow positive. You know, and it's like, it takes the stress off, even if it doesn't build your ego as much, it takes the stress off. And then you're not chasing the dollar all the time. We, we, we definitely made that mistake of, we took on a round of capital, hired a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. It was all good intentions, all good plans and ramped. And then it was like, we're burning that much money a month. Mm -hmm. And it's like, wait a minute, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then markets change and it required us to raise more capital. So we needed to make adjustments. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of done the same exact thing around, get yeah. a little bit leaner, get a little bit tighter, go make money and it's better to have more money coming yeah. in the door than out the door. Well, and it's, it's so easy to spend money when you think you have plenty mm -hmm. and in a business and you think you can go get it easily too. Oh, you can get it money easily. No big deal. Or you assume that, you know, a tree grows all the way to the sky. It doesn't yep. actually work that way. So revenue is doing this and you take on employees and it's easy to take employees on. It's harder to offboard. So when you find yourself in a position where you have to do layoffs, it's terrible. Yeah. And it happened probably because of undisciplined decision-making earlier. Sometimes it's not, you know, the direct fault of the business, but we all do it. We all take on overhead in our personal life and our business life. Wasn't really necessary. Yep. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Yep. And then pretty soon it's like, go look at your subscriptions on Apple or Google or whatever you use. <laughs> you look at all the subscriptions. You're like, some of them, you don't even remember. You yeah, started why did I make out. that decision? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm paying $900 a month for these things that I don't use Yeah, or whatever the numbers are, <laughs> like some ridiculous number. The same happens in business. So true. So true. And also I, I, I don't know if this is a mistake or not, but I'd, I'd be curious your your take on this. Um, I have found that if you have a problem, don't throw a person at it. Like we have created issue or we, we've had issues in the business that need to be resolved. Some, some good, hey, it's growth, hey, it's whatever. I don't think immediately throwing a person to try to solve that and be like, hey, this is, we, we need to go to market better. We need to, you know, grow mm -hmm. something X, Y, Z and just saying this person's going to fix that problem. I have, I have over, I have too high of expectations on some people and I mm -hmm. think probably didn't lay those expectations out clearly enough. I also don't know if it's the best solution to fixing big issues like that. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. So whenever you have a problem, don't throw a person at it. But if you have a person, you can throw a problem at them. Yeah. No, no yeah, I hadn't I thought about it that way. So. That's, yeah. that's, I'm <laughs> not sure that's true or not true. No, that's interesting too. And actually for sure with the bigger parts of business, sometimes you put the wrong skill set toward a problem. Yeah. And this is where I think businesses working in silos create some problems. If your 
a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so if you're a product person and you see an issue and you're going to try and solve it with product, if you're in sales, you're probably going to solve it with sales. Yeah. And I think if, if you get a team together and you say, we have this issue, how is this best solved? It might be a finance thing. Mm -hmm. it might be an HR thing. You're like, maybe it's solved with a different function than what you're thinking. So, you know, Patrick and Theo, and we've had this debate. I have no problem sharing this. Mm -hmm. So Patrick is a very much, this is our CTO. He's mm -hmm. a very much a product driven person. Everything should be product forward. Theo's a sales guy. Everything mm -hmm. should be sales forward, right? So it's this amazing clash of, well, we can solve all of our problems if we just get more revenue. That's true. Mm -hmm. We can solve all of our problems if our product works well. Also true. Watching that conflict happen is one of the most entertaining debates because and now they know each other well enough to know kind of where they come from. But watching people who kind of view the world, it's it's the best. I, I, I think leadership gets really hard when you have two really smart people who are both right and are convinced the other person's wrong. Mm -hmm. And you sit there and you watch that and you're like, this is going to be interesting how this pans out. Yeah. One thing you have, you have two leaders there who are secure enough that they want what's right, not who's right, exactly. ultimately. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully they go right to the edge, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. right before one of them <laughs> taps out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's what's right, not who's right. I like healthy conflict with people who respect each other. Completely. Like when you can come to that and you see that, I see that with families and this might be, you know, I have three older brothers and a younger sister. So we were definitely, there was, I don't know if it's healthy. We you, have were a lot of you were thrown into conflict. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with conflict. <laughs> but the idea is like you learn how to debate an issue from all sides of the issue yep. and understand it better and sometimes realize you were wrong. Now you never admit that with siblings, so that's a different issue. Yep. But realizing that I might not have been looking at this right. And when you create a culture that it's okay to be wrong, yeah, like, you know what? I, th I think you're right. I think you have a better view on this than I do. And if you can do that without getting trashed, yeah, then you, you create a really nice environment. But that's, that's one thing I think you do have is you have a sales perspective and a product perspective. They're very different and hopefully create good, healthy conflict. Yeah. But they're also smart enough to want the business to win, not themselves. Yeah. Watching, seeing, I think you said it right, confident people who not that they don't have egos, because mm -hmm. I actually think a little bit of ego is a good thing, but confidence that allows themselves to say, oh, I don't need to be right in this. I mm -hmm. care what's best for the business. I'm going to present my case, my my approach. That's why I'm here. And I'm able to hear yours. I think it's very obvious. I've learned more and more and more. It's very obviously when somebody has a point they're trying to make and you know they're not listening to you at all, mm -hmm. they might sell themselves as listening, but they haven't thought about it from the other side. I think that becomes pretty obvious and yeah. Well, I think debate teams, right? They, they, you're required to take both sides of an argument. Which I think is great. You're required to argue the other side, which is really healthy too. Yeah. And sometimes you can even facilitate that in a discussion. You'd say, well, how would the other point of view, like how would someone else think about this? And you can get someone to start to bring that forward and see if they can think about it the other way. I'm not the best at this, but I'm definitely working on it. I, when I know that I'm like irrationally upset about something and it's somebody who I trust and care about, mm -hmm. Usually it's because I'm not seeing it right mm -hmm. now. I'm irrationally upset for some reason, some shape or form. But I think I think it's really healthy to take a step back and be like, that person did something that made me that upset or mm -hmm. that faulted or whatever it is, probably for a reason that I'm not seeing all the details behind. Mm -hmm. And I think definitely in like leadership teams like that, being able to see like, oh, Patrick or Theo or I did something that was totally out there, right? Yeah there's probably more to the story than just them being totally irrational. And so I don't know, I've worked on that. Well, and I think that's compounded with distributed workforces Yeah, where, you know, in the last 15 years I've kind of been like in different places of the world distributed, but when you're not, so when you're consistently face to face, there also is some more degree of trust and respect and, and uh, less tension from things like text. Yeah. You know, number one rule when there's conflict back away from the keyboard. <laughs> Don't text right Nothing away. good happens from here forward. <laughs> Nothing, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's and good marriage advice too, by the way. It is good. <laughs> back like back away from Mickey Ward. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm going to filter my comments on that. But no, that's true. But you know, like when you're not in the same, like pick up the phone. Yeah. Or meet in person. Like there's just some things where, uh, like you said, actually, you know, in personal relationships, like in a marriage, just sitting down and saying, I'm not sure how we're so far apart on this or, you know, whatever the topic is, it's, dif it starts to diffuse the issue immediately. And I, you can do the same thing in business, usually. Not always, but typically you can diffuse things if you get the emotion out of it. So I also find that um, people who, so if I did something that I messed up and I wronged you, mm -hmm. most people would rather, I'm gonna send you a text and wait for your feedback mm -hmm. by text. I think if you're the person who's been faulted, it's better to actually hear that 
wrongness that you've mm-hmm. done in person. Cause I think people are not softer about the way that they like, I'll give you a prime example. We, we have a, we have an investment group and there was an expectation that we set and we missed it. And I knew, I was expecting a very long email that mm-hmm. was going to be, you know, pretty attacking. I went and sat with those guys in person and we had a great, I mean, they give me some harsh feedback, but it was good. Mm -hmm. But I think you one, build strong relationships that way. I think two, Mm -hmm. people respect people who can actually take harsh feedback. Mm -hmm. And I think you, I don't know. I think there's a lot to hearing kind of difficult conversations in person, not just, I want to avoid the conflict, but I think specifically like if you, if you know you've wronged somebody or you've messed up, whatever, go hear that feedback in person. And I think you, you'll get a lot better. And I think you'll also build a stronger relationship too. I guess really solid advice. And they also listen to understand, don't listen to respond. So true. And especially when you don't agree. (laughs) So on my podcast, I have gone back and listened occasionally. And Mm -hmm. when I start saying, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's when I know I'm not listening. I'm just just like, like, let's move on the topic. Most, (laughs) Most people are sitting there waiting for their turn to say what they want to say. Yeah. I've found this where not just with conflict, just even understanding, like um, to broaden the horizon of the people you can influence or lead or inspire, I think you have to get outside of yourself because you, we already know how we think. I yeah. know how I think. So how can I work with someone who's socialized in a very different way than I would think? They may grew up in a different country or in a different culture, or you know, I tend to be pretty extroverted, middle-aged, straight, white, American male, mm-hmm. right? Well, there's a lot of categories outside of that that I don't relate to socialization-wise. And so sitting down with employee resource groups or just with individuals and saying, give me your perspective on like what matters here and how did, how do you view that? And tell me more about it. I don't have to agree with them. I can completely disagree with someone and say, so when I do or say this, how do, how do you feel? Yeah. And what do you think causes that? Like, how would you do it differently? That's not, even if you have conflict with someone, if you disagree with it, it's still helpful to know, like, where are they coming from? Because I think most people, if you really get down to it and you understand why they're wired the way they are, you may not agree with them, but you understand it. You can rationalize it. Yeah. yeah. It's just like politics, you know, like politics can be so divisive, especially on social media and you're throwing memes at each other and, and you get these camps and these cults of this group and that group. And yeah. if this group says it is wrong, it's like, well, maybe it's actually right. You just didn't like the boys. But, and no one's willing to do that. But if you're willing to just understand, like, why do you feel this way? And how do you think this way? and just shut up and listen. By the time they talk through it, you still may completely disagree on the topic, but you can understand the person. Yeah. And you're like, I can see how you feel that. Like if, if I were you, I would probably come from that. So at least you can respect the human. Yeah. And like respectfully disagreeing is part of what makes great society. But disagreeing means I can, dis, I can dislike you and I can dislike the topic and I'm willing to listen. Yeah. Like that's hard. You know Rocky Howard on our board? Yeah. Yeah. So she, she's black female. She, so we, we come from different worlds, right? She is my favorite person where I'm like, look, there's a lot about this world that I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you, but I want to ask. And I, so I think it was when the George Floyd, um, that, that that all happened. I called her. I'm like, there's a lot of things I don't understand about Mm -hmm. this can I ask kind of unfiltered questions? And she so appreciated the fact that I was, she's like, Hey, maybe you shouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. Just learned a lot. But I think you need people in your life who sees the world so differently, but you have enough of a respect to say, I'm going to ask something and I don't have any ill intentions about it. Might come across wrong. But I, I also think like there's maturity in giving people the benefit of the doubt that most people don't mean to be necessarily offensive. Most people don't mean to be ill intentions, but I, I, I think finding people in your life that you can, have enough respect to say, I know that was totally out there and you probably shouldn't have said that, but I respect you enough to know that maybe we should have a conversation about that. And she's been an amazing person, at least in yeah, some of those conversations for me. This is a great example of that. And I think there's, you know, uh, we can only barely control ourselves. We can't control everyone <laughs> I was about else. To say, that's stretchy. So, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know that we even can, but we can better understand, we think we can understand ourselves pretty well. I'm not sure if that's even true. But I think the idea that, um, being able to listen to other people and be able to um, at least empathize with where they're coming from helps a lot. And then we're so unconscious in the way we do things. So for example, when I first started leading teams outside of the US, I started to realize from feedback, I asked for feedback a lot, how many times I use sports metaphors, for example, and American sports metaphors. 
didn't mean anything to yeah, people yeah. I was talking to. First of all, just kind of block out, and tackle, just block and tackle. Yeah, block and tackle. <laughs> you, you were just at the one yard line. You really hit that one out of the park. You know, like all this stuff that just makes no sense to anyone. First of all, uh, turns out not everyone's into sports. Yeah, really. It's insane. I don't get it. Like whatever. But no, and and also American sports analogies. And from a certain era, you, you talk to people who are really into like movies and TV shows, or whatever, whatever era they're from, they're quoting these things and you'd be like, no yep, idea what no you're idea. talking about. Yep. Um, all of those things are, we don't realize them, but they're selfish. They're yeah. us speaking to ourselves in terms we understand. And I think like the best communicators out there kind of communicate at sort of a eighth grade or uh, grade nine uh, level communication so that everyone can understand, sort of put the cookies on the lower shelf, you know? Yeah. And they make it easy. People who are trying to sound sophisticated or smart or really intelligent, they lose a lot of people because they're trying to be like experts and trying yeah. to be seen as something better. I. I hate to say it, but you know, how to win friends and influence people. It's cliche, but it is such a good book because so much of it's related to the other person, not you. Yeah. Right. And some of it's slightly manipulative, but it's, I think in a good way, use people's names. Yep. There's a bit of mirror image. There's talk at the pace they're talking. Right. I mean, it's, I, I think there's a lot of things you can do that. That, that is to me, you, that's a fundamental book for I, anybody listening to people in, in anything related to people, how to win friends and influence people. It's, it's been like how to be likable. Yeah. And, how to bring the other person out of themselves. Yeah. I think that's been converted or translated into 120 languages, something like that. Yeah. Um, and there's another one that uh, isn't as popular, but it's called The Magic of Thinking Big by mm. a guy named David Swartz. Same era, like way back in, I don't know, 100 years ago or yeah. something. But it's really just about you can choose to think of, see things larger than you're seeing it, and you probably have a better perspective on it. But there's a lot of those just fundamental things that I think can go a long ways. Invest in yourself. Yeah. Not that, not that hard. No, it's not that difficult, believe it or not. Okay. Everyone's looking at me now. I have to move the conversation. Yeah, on. that's what we do. Yeah. Like. Oh, but you mentioned something earlier about you personally, that you're running this run, right? Yeah. You're running across the Baja Peninsula. Yeah. Why the heck would you waste your time with that? You know, they've, <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm being silly, but, but that is something you've decided to take on, right? You don't, you're not a runner. No, we gave that away. Um, I, uh, so moderation is something I'm not very good at. So to me, we were talking about this, like I have so much respect for the runners who run every day, go to half marathons, five Ks, 10, whatever. That's great. That is not exciting to me. And there's nothing motivating about that. So I had, uh, I played college across for a year. So I grew up as an athlete. I think I'd never run more than three miles and kind of through a random happenstance did a marathon on a treadmill with no training. I was actually, I think I'd had a little wine and beer, a wow. little wine and pizza the night before. So it's just like, to me, it was just the mental challenge of going through something like that. So there's a pastor um, actually here in Chicago that I'm friends with. I'm on this youth force board with, and he's a runner. He's done 48 marathons and 48 states. He's done crazy stuff. And I was kind of like, all right, if this guy can do it, he's not like, when you look at him, you wouldn't picture the guy who's done these things. I'm like, all right, I can do that. So I'm doing it for a charity. It's Baja Traverse. It's a hundred miles and it's like 94 in three days. Day wow. one's like 46. Day two, I think is 26 or 28, but it's up 6,000 feet, down 6,000 feet. And then day three is like 18. And so for me, it's one, it's just the insanity of a mental challenge like that. Like I just need something in my life that I think gets me motivated and excited. Um, I think there's health reasons. And then also like, it's cool. It's a really cool cause. So I'm on this uh, board It's called the global youth force and it's designed around inspiring leaders, young leaders around the world. And um, so, yeah, it's kind of one of those. When is the scheduled tour? February 3rd through the 5th. And I think my dad's going to ride an ATV alongside and do a little drone footage and film it. So it'll be fun. That's amazing. Good luck. Yeah. I think we're the first Americans to do it. I think last year there was 10 folks from Mexico that did it. And I think this is, I think we're the first, I'm, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure we are. So wow, be cool. Yeah, I think awesome. Wade, Wade might do it. Yeah, Wade, any any uh, cross country runs or or well, Matt's trying to talk me into doing this one. Yeah, and I don't know. He started pitching me on it, and uh, seems like a good idea. The, I don't know. It sounds like a terrible idea. Seems like, it sounds yeah, like yeah, an inspiring thing. Famous the, last so, so, words. So, so the like only so the, like the the mentals the mental piece I'm not super worried about. I like am psycho enough that if it's something I want to do, I'm probably going to mm -hmm. do it. The physical training, I just need to be there. But the thing I'm worried about is like blisters. Like there's there, like, I know that sounds like so weenie, but like it's it's literally like that piece or some, you tear calf muscle, something that like you mm -hmm. can't really train for that just kind of, that's the only piece I'm like, that's what's gonna suck. And I know mm -hmm. something like that's gonna yeah, happen. Yeah, you say you have the mental fortitude, but when it's mixed in with, with physical pain, yeah. you, know, you really test your mental fortitude yeah. to see if you can 
when you're in the through. middle of nowhere on a trail with people that you don't really want to talk to for 18 straight hours, not in a bad way, but it's like after a while you're like, all right, there's nothing much to talk about, but I don't know. I, the thing that I like about this though, is I, I share the, um, need for something extreme to focus on yeah. because, um, I don't do well in the mundane, like the day to day, like I, I don't idle well. Yeah. And fitness wise, one of the problems that I run into is not having that next thing. Cause so as somebody who was like a competitive athlete growing up and you, you wrestled know, in college, right? Yeah, yeah. I wrestled at university of Nebraska and had, yeah. you know, had a, a brother at Northwestern and have three sons who are competitive wrestlers. And, you know, so, but you don't just kind of like walk down the street and find a wrestling match, you know? So, so, uh, not doing that competitively, although I could, but anyway, not doing that. Um, <laughs> And then running, you know, like if I have something to shoot for, and I haven't really, there's, it's easy enough to justify whatever you want to justify, but I haven't done a marathon. I haven't had any of those things that I set goals out to do. And so the idea of having something that is um, both inspiring, but also just gives you the discipline. It's sort of like life. It's actually the dream is what gives you the discipline to discipline your flesh, to do the things, to accomplish the thing. Yeah. It's, what's that quote? Um, a guy named Bill Brett used to put this on his plaques when people had a, a level in his business. They said that, uh, and it's a quote from somebody that uh, man's greatest reward for his dedication to excellence is not what he gets from it, but who he becomes through it. Words to that effect. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason why, like, I need something like this in my life to form. Like, I'm not a disciplined person at all. I'm a motivated person, but not disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I think this kind of forces the hand of like, okay, I can go run one marathon randomly, but can I go do three and can I do the discipline of the training that requires daily commitment to it? And that I, I typically by default wouldn't do it. And so that's also why I've, uh, I've kind of gone public with it as in like, I've told people that like, if I don't do this now, I totally wussed out and like, that's on me. And we're so going to run this section just over and over and over <laughs> again for like a year straight. Yeah. If yeah. you don't do it. Oh yeah. Well, uh, see, exactly. That's exactly what I mean. Uh, does success mean to you that you've signed up and you're going to do it? Or does that really mean you're finish it? Because you know, there's a chance you're not going to reach the finish line, right? Success you, means that I show up the first day. Show up to do. All right. Well, because I know if I do, I'm going to finish it. Yeah. Now, if I have to walk it, so be it. But I'm, I'm, I'm if it's literally getting to that day saying I've trained it, I've trained what I needed to train or set out to train. And I'm there that day. I, at that point, it's it's less about the run. It's just like mm -hmm. I did everything that it took to get there. That's amazing. Well, sounds amazing. Sounds I, haven't amazing. I haven't done it yet. I was about to say it's, it's well, easy to commit it on on, the sh on this podcast. So. What will be amazing is after the February six when we're sitting on check in with us. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. There's a life metaphor there, though. My my father in law, who is also a mentor of mine, um, I met him before I met my wife. Actually, he had this phrase about showing up for practice, and he he had also been a, a wrestler and then a wrestling coach and official and stuff like that and in the state of Minnesota for a long time. But his idea of just showing up for practice, is like, you know, when people become great at something, the first thing they do is they show up for practice. Yep. Show up for practice every day. They may not be good at it. They may not have the right form, they may not have the, but they're showing up for practice they're every day. And eventually they'll get good at it. Yeah. But you can't be good at something and then not practice and stay good at it. So showing up is like a big part of it. So I think there's also a conversation related to that around entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. around... So I think, I don't know what percentage, but a vast majority of entrepreneurship is less around the, the high moments and it's showing up every day. Mm -hmm. And I like, we, we talk about, you know, there's go be an alpha, go be a lion, go be mm -hmm. all these, you know, picturesque things. I think most of entrepreneurship is being a cockroach. It's mm -hmm. literally surviving the next day. And I think there's going to be seasons where that looks great. Everything you, you close your funding round, but, after most of the time I've closed our funding round, it's like, I want to take a nap, not mm -hmm. pop a bottle of champagne or anything yeah. like that. But I think so much of it is surviving the next day and, and just consistently showing up. And I think that's as it's, it's weird because as a thrill seeker, right. And you're mm -hmm. similar in the sense of living life in extremes and going through the extreme moments. I think so much of it is not that in fact, majority of it, it's not that. Yeah. I think people seek the wrong thing. Like exactly what you said, they seek that the enthusiasm and the joy of the moment. Like you're thinking you're at an event and you're all motivated and inspired. Yeah. That's not what success is. Success is keeping that feeling during the mundane daily things. Success is built on a whole bunch of mundane patterns. And you just have to show up and do it again and again with great enthusiasm. I've, I've never debated somebody on this, but it always pisses me off when somebody's like, man, it must be nice to set your own schedule when people talk mm, about it. And yeah. it's like, do you know, the, the greatest pain about that is I can go play around a round of golf, but I can't not be thinking about what I have mm -hmm. to do. Like if I'm playing around in golf, I need, I mentally, I'm like, I gotta, 
I got to be focused on something else or I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all the different things that I need to do. And that's the, not the pain, but that's some of the stuff that you don't see that I think entrepreneurship creates this false narrative of like, Social media certainly doesn't help with destroys that. Destroys it, yeah. I mean, people yeah. put out only the good stuff. But yeah. Really, what I think is most interesting is the hard stuff. Those yeah. mundane tasks, doing them over and over again. Because that's, that's like you said, where you, you know, you get that limp in your leg. That's, that's where it comes from. That's exactly right. You know, because also I think people pursue happiness. And I think that that's a little bit of a false narrative if they think about happiness as a lack of strife. A lot of times people feel happy like, oh, I'm at peace. Well, you're never going to be in shape if you're only pursuing lack of strife. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be successful financially if you don't discipline yourself. Actually, what creates success, if you will, is a bunch of things you don't want to do. It's dealing with resistance. It's still, like, you have to embrace the fact that too hard for you, just right for me. Yep. You know, like, like, why is it somebody who is like really fit? They're putting most of the time is, is struggle. And then with moments of looking in the mirror going like, I look amazing or yeah. whatever, like a bodybuilder would do, but most of it's pain and struggle. And it's not that you don't have to, you don't have to be a, um, what's the word? Like you don't have to feel like a martyr, Yeah, yeah. but like, yeah, you got to show up and, and deal with that stuff. That's part of life. It's like, if you're a parent and you're like, I love everything about being a parent, except, um, except changing the diaper and then feeding them and then cleaning up after them and like paying attention to them. Like that part, I don't like, I like the other parts. <laughs> what other parts? Yeah. You know, it's, it's about serving and about giving. And if you can't find joy in giving and joy in serving using that yeah. analogy, you're never going to look back at the ch that, that child's, you know, childhood with joy. And I think people think they're pursuing happiness and they're just trying to avoid pain. Yeah. And it's not a good way to do it. And I also think, um, at least in the entrepreneurial metaphor, I definitely find it to be true that not that you get tampered by the highs, but I think some of the, like, y y there's always kind of the next level. There's always mm -hmm. another zero to add to it. And it's funny how, like, there's not many excitements like your first car. When you mm -hmm. get your first car, you clean that car for whatever reason more than you do anything else. And then your next car is a little bit less exciting. And mm -hmm. it's not that, like, it's depressing or anything like that. But there's definitely something to be said about you could always be chasing that next thing and you're yep. never going to find it no matter what it is. Yeah, I can tell you, it's just like with money. There's a certain amount of money you think, man, like, when I was a kid, I remember thinking, it'd be really great to make, like, a couple thousand dollars a month. Yeah. And then it's like, man, six figures used to be a thing. Yeah. You know, six figures, you know, it's like, and then two commas, it, 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 those numbers aren't that big. It like, and it, like cars is a good example too. It's something that you want to do, but I, I can tell you this, like the more zeros you put behind buying a car, eventually it's just like, uh, you know, then it starts to become a burden. Yeah. Stuff I, becomes a burden. I just bought a new car four days ago and I had no emotions to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I used to love flipping cars. I got so excited. <laughs> this one, I literally walked in impulsively bought it. I'm like, all right, great. It's another car. And it's like, that's it's it's great. A little, it's, a it's a great car, but it's like, it's a little depressing. It's, it's like, all right, that's like, if I, if I knew, you know, 10 years later, uh, yeah. I was going to buy that and I was thrilled with it. I was like, oh, that's really cool. Now it's like, mm. see the arc of your life and what interests you changes a hundred percent. It's very scary. Yeah. It absolutely yeah. does. Like to me, the most exciting time financially was actually, so I, uh, how do we put this? When my wife and I got married, both of our net worths plummeted. So we both had debt and I hate debt. I don't like going money. And so the, to me, joy was just like being debt free. Yeah. So like the joy isn't, wasn't necessarily the things. It was the fact that I could pay cash for it. Yeah. If I could buy, you know, cars, houses, whatever it was and not have debt and the financial planners tell you how stupid that was. And they're probably right. Yeah. But, but to your point, like different points in life is like, I just didn't want to deal with that. Yeah. I don't want a payment. I don't want this and that. It's not about at that point, it's not about what it looks like to other people. It's like what other people don't see. And I think you also have to know yourself, like what, what brings joy. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes self-aware, which yeah. I think is a theme that we talk about a lot. Yeah, there's some, I, have, I have a friend of mine who has, you know, a lot of financial wherewithal. Um, doesn't have anything on the outside that you would see as wealth. He doesn't like stuff. He's a minimalist. You know, lives in a little place, doesn't have very much stuff. And to him, that's just joy. He can do whatever he wants whenever he wants. Good for him. Yeah. Other people, they gotta have bling. <laughs> you know, I have a friend of mine who has, they have a, a safe in their basement that's awesome and it's filled with these bags that are like ridiculously expensive bags. Um, she's into it and she likes it and, and like neither one of those is right or wrong. I love the fact that both of those different people, they're different yep. and they can find joy in their own way and both of them discipline themselves and work their tails off to get where they are. Got to have respect for that. I just feel that way about watches. I was like obsessed with young age where you get this beautiful fancy watch and I got the watch. Now look at me. I don't even wear a watch anymore. So, so it just goes to show, you know, the, when you're young and you're stupid, you don't know. Yeah. You think what's important to you really matters. And then yeah. 
and, and something and, changes. And, and, and we don't even need watches anymore. No, right. kind of what you do. It. I, check my I, phone. I got my watch because I got tired of carrying my phone when I was running. So I got an Apple Watch because I could go. I don't have to do that. I yeah. can just run it. And and now I do dumb things like track my sleep with a watch. I mean, how dumb is that? Yeah. But so but I, I, can, aura I can and then I can say, oh, how well did I sleep last night by looking at my watch? Like or just like. I'm rested. I feel pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't need a watch to tell me that was a terrible night's sleep. I was rolling yeah. around the whole time. It's so funny how much do. we yeah. collect all this data that doesn't matter, and we 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 look at it and we're like like all the apps that track everything. Oh, the standing that hours, you can, yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, like you, I you know, be, you, I was know like, yeah. you know for a fact a day you were physically active versus when you weren't. Like I know, I know, I sat and did nothing yesterday versus yeah. oh, I I'm tired today, right? Yeah, and it's like oh, that was a good day. Well, seasons change in life. I mean, like I was a division one college athlete and now my watch tells me when to stand up. <laughs> like, and it's it's a, the worst a, thing in the world when you're doing a workout and your, your watch is like, are you done? It's like, oh, <laughs> that's still, offensive. Hey man, I'm still working here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Anyway, I think we've really gone off the rails here. Yeah, about yeah, this yeah. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> this is where I wrap it up, right? I did. We've said it all we've said too much. So I'm going to thank both of you for coming here. And listen, Matt, any, any last word? How do we get it? If we want to listen to your, to your podcast, where do we find it? Uh, the Matt Baxter show.com. You can find it there. Uh, I don't have any other social media anymore other than LinkedIn and, uh, but you can find it on the Matt Baxter show.com, but it's that, on Spotify, Apple music, all the different platforms. I looked at your LinkedIn or not your LinkedIn, your Instagram. Need some, need some help there. Yeah. Hey, uh, can I ask a question on that one? Sure. Talk to me a little bit about like shutting off a lot of the social media noise in your yeah. life. Why did you do that? And what kind of results are you seeing from it? Um, so for me, it was nothing but distractions. So I don't have an Instagram anymore. No Facebook, no nothing. Um, I did had a decent amount of followers. Mm -hmm. It was like one, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't like that. It was dumb to chase that. I definitely did. It mm -hmm. worked. Um, but to me, it's, uh, my idle time. I'm now when you first do it, you just quickly find something else, mm -hmm. right? So if you de delete Instagram, you go to TikTok. If you delete TikTok, you play chess, whatever yeah. it is, you're going to find something else. So I think I've started to force my hand on realizing when I'm seeking something because I'm bored mm -hmm. versus seeking something because I, I, I am uncomfortable with my own downtime. So, I mean, for me, just Instagram and Facebook, uh, there was nothing but, I don't really have the comparison syndrome as mm -hmm. much on that stuff, but it was more, like, there's just nothing good that comes from that. I just yeah. don't need to be scrolling. It just doesn't help me. So that feeling I think is a good thing. And also like when you, uh, when I wake up in the morning, there was a period of time that I would roll over and be like, oh, I'm waiting for something. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but I'm waiting for something on those platforms. Now that I don't have it, that there was definitely that period of time. I don't have that feeling anymore. That's great. Cool. So yeah, there's, it's just been a healthy, like, and, and also I found myself a ton. I'm posting so that I look impressive for other people and I needed to, for, I needed to remove that for myself. And it's not that I don't care about some of that still, but to me, I had to force myself not to do that. I think that's a message a lot of people need to hear. I mean, it's so solid too, because getting the dopamine hits from what someone else did or said or whatever versus doing something in your life where you can get the same yeah. feel. I have friends in recovery that talk about how it's very similar from substance abuse where people get to a point where they just have to have more and more of it. And, and social media, I think digital electronic addiction, very similar. Yeah. So a hat tip for you for making, taking control of just like your headspace so yeah. that you can control it. Well, if you don't mind, there's like a so one of the things I've been thinking about is entrepreneurship is stressful. So there's points in the, and just life is stressful, right? So there's points in the day where it's like, man, I'm like, I need, I don't want to get out of bed. I'm stressed, wh whatever it is. And I've sort of been on a hunt of what are the, cause there's definitely the long tail of like, okay, me training for this run over the next mm -hmm. six months, I'm going to get healthier, right? Lose some weight, different things like that. But also like, what are things in the middle of the day that you only have 10, 15, 20 minutes to do that can be a positive mm. impact in your life. So one, um, ice bath for sure, or ice shower, like immediately relieves everything. Mm -hmm. Like that for me, if I'm like stressed, things didn't go well, bad email, whatever it is, like jump in cold water, that for sure. And I hate how, like, but that it, it does work. Mm -hmm. Secondly, like I've tried to do like 20 to 30 minute, even if it's a short run or walk, no phone, no nothing. Don't talk on the phone. Like, cause mm -hmm. previously I would try to talk on the phone during that blah, blah, blah. But that getaway, I think has been a, been a huge help. And, yep. and usually that time would have been filled on Instagram, TikTok, whatever, but trying to do things that are like quick wins that I know that are good for me. Um, that has helped a ton. That's so, smart. Yeah. I like it. Working on it. Great. That's great. And Wade, how do we get, how do we get in touch with you? Yeah. How do you get a hold of Wade? How do we get a hold of Wade? If we want to go down to Texas, I've been, not, I've been there. It's, <laughs> It's very nice. Yeah, Austin. No, hey, one's, Austin. no one's suffering in Austin, that's <laughs> no. for sure. It's uh, plenty of people are suffering in Austin. People are suffering everywhere, mostly self-imposed. Um, 
I mean, <laughs> not that that, yeah, not that, that. The suffering, I can tell you the suffering, the suffering in my life is self-imposed and yeah, I would yeah, assume the suffering all, in almost everyone's life is self-imposed. Always like true. Like we do on social media that no, where there's no suffering in our lives. Yeah, right? that's yeah, exactly. And, and that's, that's, that's rubbish, you know, and that's one thing. It's that's boring. It makes social media incredibly boring. It, uh, it just becomes a vanity game, you know, and, and I think mostly social media still, if you really get to the, to, to the gist of it, it's still a mating platform. Is people trying to connect with each other or people trying to validate themselves, whether they're married, not married, or whatever, they're trying to validate themselves. I think we all do it to some degree. Now there are some, there's some good business reasons. There's some great messages to get out. Like I don't want to underplay, like we lived in, in England for a couple of years. My two youngest sons started school there. And so we stayed in touch with all of our friends in the U S via sure. social media. That was fantastic. The grandparents and grandkids, and that was beautiful. And so I don't want to take away from the technology. The people that built these platforms are amazing. And it's not that they started with some kind of ill intent to mess up people's psychological profile, I believe. Um, however, like everything can be used for good or bad. You know, what ends up working? Vanity. Vanity mm -hmm. works everywhere. Like at every, any kind of advertising anywhere, it's all vanity. Yeah. As Solomon said, vanity and vexation of spirit. And you get a lot of vanity and vexation of spirit out there in social media. So I think how you use it, like Matt's a good example, making conscious choice of what works for him still leveraging it for your business, but in ways that work for you. And I think if people can get control of that instead of what does society want me to do, but what's best for me, I think is, is, is good. That's great. I, I like social media personally. I find it to be a creative outlet for me. For sure. Um, that I can yeah. create something that for me entertains me at the very least. That's what I always say. At least I tell myself that. So a healthy void that I feel from it is TikTok taught me how to cook. Like I, I just got into cooking because of TikTok grilling mm -hmm. stuff that I never would have thought about doing. And now it's like, I'm not going to go sit on YouTube and watch a cooking channel or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So like, that's an area where it's like definitely healthy. Like I enjoyed that. That was a fun, like taught literally I, I like decided mm -hmm. to get into cooking because of that. So anyways, no, yep. how you get a hold of me is I'm Wade Burgess on pretty much everything, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm not fancy like you guys and have like a podcast and you know, I'm not, I'm not elevated yeah, in no, that capacity. All my, all my three followers, including my yeah, mom. I mean, like, yeah. hat tip to your mom. And hey, mom, if nobody else watches, thanks for watching us. We really appreciate you. <laughs> she knows how to find us. I have to send her the link. Tor 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 download it. I turn it on. I turn up volume. Anyway, Tom, we've said it all, right? Tom's like glazed over over there. He's had enough. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks. Cheers.